please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Joel Angel. All right, thank you. Um, as Jason said, what I prefer is that if you have a question, um, I would like to try to take them as they come up. If it's something that I will explain in a few minutes, I'll say let's defer on that and we'll come back to it. But feel free to ask questions anytime. I kind of like to make this a little bit more interactive and dynamic. Um, so we're hopefully going to have fun in here. So I got a quick raise of hands. How many people actually know what a maturity model is? That's great. So I'm very, very happy to hear that. So some of this we might be able to go over very fast. Other parts we might want to spend a little time on. This is the bio, uh, enough of the introduction. We don't need to spend much time on that. So what I want to talk about today, we got about, I, you know, I'm leaving myself 40 minutes or so of content, is it's going to be broken down into three areas. The first is going to be some foundation concepts, because it's really important that we all are working from a similar baseline of both knowledge and intent of what we're going to do. Then we're going to talk a little bit about um, how maturity models and frameworks can coexist. And then finally, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce some ways that we're starting to create customizable tool sets that allow us to better use the NIST cybersecurity framework and maturity models in performing um, self-assessments of installations. My background right now is I work for AECOM in the management services group, so I balance my time between doing government work um, with Department of Defense, the intelligence communities, and others, as well as working in um, the private sector with, you know, standard um, privately held or publicly held corporations. And it gives me an opportunity to kind of see the world from two very different eyes, right? So when you tend to think of the U.S. government, the U.S. government has a very large budget. Where when you start to go into the private sector, budget tends to be a big concern, right? Because they're here to make money. Where I kind of laugh, the U.S. government's more there to spend money. But we can really see some disparity on how things are moving. So, of course, what that results in is the generation of a lot of paper and a lot of tools and regulations and standards and best practices to help people start to be able to become more cyber aware. This triangle represents the core set of what I would call the documentation suite when we start to look at cybersecurity. Now, I've drawn it in an inverted manner because most of the time people will draw these, this pyramid showing the documents being the width of the, of, the, of the pillar, right? So where I put policies at the bottom, it's not that that's the biggest range of documents, quantities. Policies tend to be very short, very broad, very organizational, few exceptions granted. But it's the foundation upon which everything else has to be built. So that's why in this drawing we start at the bottom because for a policy what we want to do is we want to understand why we're doing something. And for those that have implemented against any of the NIST guidances or the ISO 27000 family, you'll notice that in almost every one of those documents, the first step for any family of security controls is to create policy documents. So you follow 853, there's about 14 or so policies that have to be written. And once you have the policies in place, it then allows you to move forward into deploying specific controls around what you're going to do, and that's when we bring in the standards. So it could be 853, it could be 27,002, those type of, of, of documents. So they're now providing the mandatory steps in what we're going to do, and then the other sets of documents that you add on that become incrementally more precise. Now when we get into the procedures realm, we're starting to specify exactly how we're going to do something, step by step. And then as you start to go down even further, actual purchasing specifications that say we're going to use brand A, brand B, brand C. So this is our huge library. And right now it's as vast as the world is in countries, right? So every country has an organization similar to our NIST where they're creating their own body of documents. So the problem is, and, and I don't know, is, did anybody do any of the content review and submission to the framework in either version 1.0 or 1.1? Same. So one thing that the Department of Commerce did when they sent this out when they were looking at a revision was they asked people for some understanding of what's working and what's not. 
And of course, for me, my biggest comment was, was the failure to truly identify the global wealth of knowledge when it comes to these document sets. So one of the leaders in this area happens to be the, the United Kingdom. And if you do any work navigating the library of information like in the CISA site or what used to be the US CERT and ICS CERT sites, a lot of that original documentation was written by the Center for Protection and National Infrastructure in the UK. When you start to look at ICS and the specifics around control systems, there are a lot of good emerging documents on this. Some of the ones that are not released publicly exist for some of the countries in the Gulf region in the Middle East and the Far East as well. They all have a good body of, of knowledge in these documents, but the ability is, is that there's not a lot of coercion between how we can start to apply the best practices across. So everybody in here used, well, we used to call them the SANS critical controls, but now the CSC critical controls lineup. There's an equivalent version of that that was developed in, the, in Australia by their department at a defense equivalent, which is actually a very impressive document. And that's why when we start to talk about how we're going to use these tools to customize as we move forward, you'll start to see how I blend them in. So what's a framework? A framework really isn't the how. It's more of a recipe that each organization can take and tweak it and adjust it to fit their particular business justifications, right? Because two companies will never operate exactly the same. So we run into this dilemma when we start to look at things like federal regulations. They say, thou shalt do this. It's great when it's very industry specific. And the best example of that's what they did with the critical infrastructure the, the CIP standards for the electric utilities. But now if you just start to take general businesses and throw them together against a concise set of controls, what you find is that a lot of people tweak and adjust them informally, right? So probably the most recognized body is the 27,000 series. But it's interesting that we can apply it to an oil and gas company as well as a hospital. And, and being able to align those two types of documents. So that's where frameworks come in, because frameworks are gonna allow us now flexibility in taking organizations' capabilities and their particular risk tolerance, the architectural differences they have, whether it's the system types or the system vendors, the manufacturers, right? Because with every system, especially in the industrial control system world, you see that vendors have different rules and requirements as to how their systems can be architected. And I always like to throw out the best one is the dual honing of assets, right? Where you've got two NICs that are connected to two different networks. A traditional IT guy would come in and say, well, you can't do that, that's not secure. But then you take vendors and roughly half the vendors Actually, that is their best practice architecture, and they are very well justified in why they do that. So that's why now what we need to do is we need to start to use these frameworks, which is really why NIST created this tool set. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at it, and we're going to start to talk a lot about things around short and long-term needs. So again, 2003 was when this really got kicked off when we came out with EO 13636. So revision one was published about a year later, lots of input from the community, and then they, re they released an updated version in April of 2008. And the key was in here was to address some of the growing concerns. And to me, the most impressive addition in version 1.1 was the specific addressing of supply chain and the, uh, the incredible amount of risk that supply chain is now starting to bring in. Because if you look at a lot of those um, campaigns that occurred, for instance, the target breach, that was a supply chain issue, right? It was through trusted entities, business partners that allowed that architecture to be breached and of course the consequences to be very well known. The other thing is, is they put a lot of emphasis in how we can do self-assessments. That's really the key here and that's the reason, um, actually I'd like to see one more, one more kind of raise of hands. How many people in here are, let's say, security providers? So consultants, or you work for a major entity. So I'm assuming then the balance is everybody else that would acquire those companies' services in order to perform it, right? So that's good. It looks like it's about 
are going to be people that would pay for services. One thing that NIST wanted to do in the development of this document was to create more tools that you can use without having to pay huge budgets to security companies to come in and tell you what you should be able to do yourself. And that's what we're going to do is we're going to do that at the end. We're going to take a look at some of the ways you can customize and tailor this. So when we take a look at the cybersecurity framework, there really is a lot in here that a lot of people kind of skip right over. Most people, when they look at the, the framework, focus on the core, which when you look at the core, it pretty much looks like everything else. It gives you this long list of the five functions, and then you have the categories and the subcategories that go beyond that. And when you look at it and you compare them, and I'm going to show you a slide, we can see side by side that all of these documents tend to be similar. And what they've even done is taken the core and the subcategories and aligned them to specific requirements in a variety of standards. They use about five standards, but what we really want to learn how to do here is to take any standard that you have, whether it's a published standard or an internal standard. And for me, for this community in particular, the one reason we like that is the ability then to take documents like the IEC 62443 and incorporate that into these type of frameworks, okay? But the two pieces that a lot of organizations overlook here are the tiers and the profiles. Tiers become very important. Now, this is a talk on maturity models, and it's important to realize that a tier is not equivalent to a maturity model. But what a tier is designed to do is to provide a measurement of how an organization handles risk in terms of their awareness, the repeatability of their processes to identify and manage it, and the adaptability and long-term support of that framework, that, that particular set of business processes. So it's very different than a maturity model. It's very different. So some people try to think that it's the same, but in fact, it's quite different because we're starting to realize that the best guidances that we can give community, the community, are going to be based on more around risk management than they are performance management. So telling you that you have to do 400 things is not going to make your system any more secure. What we want to do is we want to focus on securing the risk, because that's really what security is about. We'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. And then finally, we have the profiles. The profiles are very important because what they do is they measure where you are against where you need to be. Now that need to be is again based on your internal decision of how you want to move the organization. So it makes it a very practical tool. And why we like this is it provides a metric system so that you can look at where you're at today, where you would like to be in say two to three years and track your progress along those ways. That is very different than the traditional way of doing it. I'm working on one of our contracts. One of the services we provide is the operations and maintenance of some large government facilities. So this one happens to be where we store a lot of the low-level nuclear waste in Carlsbad, New Mexico. It's called the WIP. And inside, the inspector general came, did an audit, and found a significant security risk there. So of course, they immediately started to remediate it in the old-fashioned way. They got themselves some vulnerability scanners. They started tracking reports based on vulnerabilities so that they could show progress. And you kind of scratch your head going, what are we really doing here? Right? So there was no prioritization. There was no real profiling of where they are versus where they need to be because they kind of jumped past all of those fundamental concepts and went right to, well, we have to remove all these vulnerabilities because that's what they think is wrong with this system. So the first thing that, that, that I did as a, as a consultant with the framework was to start to provide some multidimensionality. Because the problem that I see is, and, and, and again, I always like to try to talk around examples, is most of these documents say you should do this. For instance, you should provide mechanisms to prevent the introduction of malware or unauthorized software into your architecture. 
Okay, great, everybody knows how to do that. They go buy a software product, whether it's from a McAfee of the world or a trend. Various companies provide that, these tool sets. The issue becomes you're saying, yes, you comply, but are you really complying in an industrial control system world where the bulk of the IP addresses are not traditional platforms? They're not running Windows. They're not running common desktop or server type platforms. They're running very customized, very tailored, and very specific. So how are you now preventing the introduction of malware into a PLC? Well, you're not. So why are you taking credit for doing it because you're doing it on the, let's call it the traditional IT side of the architecture and not the operational side? So this style, this tool that I put together, then created a visualization so you can break it down by asset type. And you can make this as broad or as specific as you like. I tend to use about five or six categories. So the first one, users. We have to remember that users are a big risk. So we need to address security controls around users, and that usually is where we fall into general policy type statements. But then I break it down into platforms. Windows 10 is Windows 10, whether it's in an OT environment or an IT environment. Server 2019, same. So that's nice because now we've got some commonality, but what makes those platforms very specific are the applications that we then put on them. So we may take Server 2019 and install on top of that a Schneider application that makes it a structureware system, and now it's customized ICS. So all of a sudden, the requirements become very different. And this gets really interesting and in why this becomes helpful looking at it in two dimensions is a lot of times vendors will actually have you do things that are very much against the policies that you thought you were going to implement. Good example, most of them have corrected it, but can't say 100% was the use of the Windows firewall. Some vendors right out of the gate disable the Windows firewall, right? But that sounds bad, right? Because everything else is saying we should enable that. All these new emerging standards, whether it's the Critical 20 or the Australian 35, they all talk about the importance of configuring that firewall from an egress perspective, not just from an ingress perspective. So that's why I created this two-dimensionality, because what it does is it now allows us to better understand those profiles. And using the colors, these colors kind of fade a little bit on the, on the overhead, it was meant to reveal something that I see as very typical across most sectors, is that most of the money is spent on preventative controls. And very little is spent on the detective and the response and recovery type controls. And in the ICS world, this is really a big problem. And everybody knows you can't prevent or treat a threat if you can't see it. So this whole idea around situational awareness, and there's a lot of great products that you're going to be able to see this week and companies that are going to talk about that. But that's kind of why you see this very commonly go from yellow or green on the left to very much red on the right. And the same thing becomes now when you go um, vertically on that particular axis is you'll see where people did a really good job of addressing security problems around standard technologies, excuse me, like the Windows platform. But when it came to the embedded technologies, they did a very poor job. So that was one way to do it. It helps prevent misleading results. It helps better align budget. Because I'll tell you right now, to get to these areas of an architecture and start to address true security controls, it will become very costly and very challenging. Okay, of course, that's where the IEC 62443 standards are really meant to come in and help because they're more catered to the problems in that world than they are at 27,000, which would be very well catered to a standard IT type. So, as we do this transition now, it's important to realize security reduces risk. So we implement security controls to address specific risks that we want to reduce to some tolerable level. Now, risk tolerance, this, again, maybe my, my exposure is different than a lot of other people's, but I've never found a customer that on day one of an engagement can define what their risk tolerance is. 
So you have to tell me what you're willing to accept. Because if you can't accept it, we need to reduce risk so that it's an acceptable level through the deployment of security controls. But if you can't answer the basic question, where's the project ever going to go? And I will be honest, and I'm looking forward to sharing stories over the week, I've seen most customer security programs fail because of that exact issue. They create very large projects that didn't have good boundaries that would tend to run forever. So now what we need to do is we need to look at how an organization is able to handle the implementation and maintenance and support of a security program. This is where capabilities and maturity models come in. Because without capability, you can't have security unless you want to outsource it to somebody else, right? So really what we're doing then is we're transferring risk, not necessarily mitigating it. So maturity models are really something, and again, people in the field, there's a term we always like to use is walking the walk. It's one thing to have a bunch of policy statements where you say what you're going to do, but in fact, do you really go do it? That's why these maturity models become very powerful tools, because they're very interested in assessing how people are organizationally performing their security duties. So again, processes are about talking the talk, practices are about walking the walk. Now, these particular maturity models, again, are not specific, right? They, 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 they're meant to bring about a variety of best practices, standards, regulations, depending on country, industry, so on and so forth. What they're trying to do is they're trying to allow you to create a goal set so that your organization can become competent in the areas that you see are important. And again, that's why we can vary them. Not everybody has to meet a certain competency level. It all depends on where you need to be. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So, what I did was I started to put this stuff together so we could start to see how we can blend the two worlds together. So, again, we want to be able to do this on our own. It should be a fairly repeatable process so that when we do it, we can create some common terminology and common communication mechanisms. Right? So we want, to, we want a structure that we can deploy across an entire business. Right? So my company, what, it's $25 billion and... You know, the size of the management services is like about 10 billion of that, 7 billion. So we want to be able to take this because we have to as a defense contractor. We're going to have to start following a new government requirement, which we'll talk about in a little bit, to provide an understanding of an organization's capability in terms of security. Okay? So communication, repeatability, and goal keeping or scorekeeping is really what we're looking for here. So we open up the cybersecurity framework, and we start to read it, and we see that it uses a terminology set of tiers, functions, categories, and subcategories, okay? So again, my biggest beef with NIST is they do create a terminology set that tends to deviate from others. Um, in the ICS space, the big one for me is they're, the way that they define a security level or a security assurance level is very different than the way IEC 62443 defines a security level. So what I wanted to do here was try to show you how there's some kind of alignment between the two. So NIST has four tiers where the maturity models, and the most common maturity model that we see is the CMM2, which was developed by the Department of Energy for the electric utility sector. Now, it's since then been very broadly deployed across a lot, and I'm going to give you some examples. The Cybersecurity Capability Maturity Model, so that's the CCMM. Now, what happened is, is DOD, because of some risks that they've identified over the past couple of years, has started to take this and cater it a little bit differently. So DOD, and I actually like the DOD one a little bit more than the C2M2, which there stands for Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. I really, those that know me, don't like that word certification. But DOD is going to require this. And the main underlying document set that goes with the CMMC is going to be the NIST 800-171 and 171B, which is about protecting controlled unclassified information. Now, everybody says, okay, we're not a DOD contractor. Why would I care about those documents? Has anybody in here read 800-171? 
a few. It is a very, very good document. I strongly encourage the curious to pick it up and take a look at it. It could apply to any organization because controlled information most people have. So the, the idea of being able to deploy this body around controlled documents is really useful. What they did was the 171B was an amendment, it's actually a new document, that now is really targeting the, the risks and how we manage APTs, the advanced persistent threat problem. So it's a really slick document. Okay, so let's kind of walk these through. There's, there's references in the bottom, and I want to make sure so I don't forget, the very last slide will have a QR code. I encourage you between now and then, if you don't have like on the Apple now, QR code readers are built in. Um, it's going to take you to a web page on skatahacker.com where all of these documents are actually going to be placed. And then this will move over once we get the coordination between how the training is going to be offered on um, the digital bond site versus mine. So there'll be a QR code at the end of the presentation. Okay, so remember now, the tiers are not necessarily a measure of maturity level. But you'll start to see words that become very similar. Partial, risk-informed, repeatable, or adaptive. Now remember that these were really more about how aware you are of risk how repeatable your processes are and how adapted, right? So the, the words partial means that you have very limited exposure to risk and your organization is not very risk driven. So let's kind of walk this to the right where we look at the maturity index levels of C2M2. This I like because it becomes a lot more obvious in how you answer the question. The practices or processes don't exist. So you're at, for that particular line item, you're at a maturity level of zero. Now that's the only body that has a zero. But I like it because there are a lot of organizations when you walk through here, you find out that they have very limited practices and policies documented across a lot of categories. And then the CMMC, what they do is they now, the reason I like this, and you're, this is gonna really start to get confusing, is there's, there's something that's gonna happen here is that the CMMC specifically calls out both procedural-based activities as well as practice. So it separates those two, which that's what I really like. Because now, um, if, you, if you've ever done the questions that build out of the CSET tool that Homeland Security puts together, they ask a lot of questions. And a lot of people can answer a question yes or no, but they don't look at it both ways. So you could say, yes, you say that you're doing this, but when I did my assessment last week, I did not see any evidence of that taking place. So it's really nice that we're able to split these two up into both the practices and an actual processes. So it's kind of the talk the talk and walk the walk. Now this is where you get into the meat of all these documents. And again, the volume and the page count starts to grow extensively. So the subcategories, I'm not gonna do subcategories, I showed the number, but the categories are kind of the major families that you want to address. So the, the, the framework has 23 of these categories and then each one of those is broken out into a subcategory which is more of the line item, do you have this, do you have that, so on and so forth. And no matter what document set you pick up, if you took a look at, at NERC SIP, you would find similar categorization even if you took NIST 853, you would see the control families still fall very much in line with this. Hey, yeah. Are you seeing these broken up in organizations by what part of the organization is responsible for which one? Now that's a really good question. So Brian asked, are people breaking these up organizationally within a company? And yes, the answer is because, again, I come from the manufacturing side of the world and in those companies that actually make something, operations really drives the business. Because no matter what you have in the back office, if you're not making your widget, the company's not making money, which means they're not paying salaries, which means they're not staffing IT organizations. So they do tend to be organizationally aligned. Now, they're trying to get away from having a one-size-fits-all. Corporate policies should be across the entire business. 
It shouldn't be aligned. But as we start to get more into the specifics around the standards and procedures that are deployed, they're organizationally aligned now. So the people in the, so you take a big um, integrated multinational oil company like BP or Shell, they all have a corporate office and a corporate entity and corporate policies, but they also have all of these assets scattered around the world where they need to deploy specific standards and regulations against them. And the reason this is a good talk point, Brian, is that they're faced with yet another challenge, which is that they have local regulations that have to be deployed based on their geography, whether it's in the state of California or the state of Texas or the country of Saudi Arabia or Japan. They have very unique requirements in each one of these. And that's why these documents are able to be tailored accordingly. Okay, so the, the, the C2M2 model, again, if you look and, and, and follow these through, same basic idea. High-level domains, this one's nice, it only has 10. And again, remember why this was written. It was initially written to support the Department of Energy's work around um, critical infrastructure. So it's good, it's concise, 10 domains. Each domain has both a management objective as well as operational approaches or the approach objectives, which is more um, in the, the operational side. And then again, you're able to measure them against each maturity index level. The CMMC, which is something that I'm being faced with using because of the work that we do for the Department of Defense, is the CMMC focuses now on, like I said, practices and processes, which is key because we're finding a lot of vulnerabilities from a general holistic security point of view in terms of processes and how things are handled, not necessarily in the technologies that are deployed. And again, the best example, I mean, I'm, I'm so shocked at how easy this works, is the introduction of an unauthorized device on an internal network and the ability of that device to create an outbound path that then allows it to communicate with some infrastructure outside the business security perimeter. And you're like going, what's the big deal there? Well, when we, when we start talking about what's going on now, that's a real big deal, right? So all these breaches that are occurring seem to be following a pretty consistent TTP model. They find a weakness, they exploit the weakness, they do some credential harvesting as possible, then they move laterally and start to create a foothold. And once they establish a foothold, they're then able to no longer depend on a vulnerability to be exploited, but they then establish command and control capability outside the perimeter. And again, if you did any of their work on the Experian breach, that, the, the, what they did is, is, has been done for years and will be done forever. Now, the, way the, the, the methods that the adversaries are using are becoming more advanced, but the steps are basically the same. So when you start to look at these models and we start to say, why is that happening? It's happening because people are overlooking this process and how we go through each one of these particular areas. Okay, sorry, I did a little squirreling there. So now we've got the framework, which is a good body of knowledge, but we also have our internal and external requirements that are localized. So it was kind of neat to see how people are starting to take these documents and create crosswalks. You can use the word crosswalk or mapping. I tend to like crosswalks because it falls more in line with taking a standard and showing how it maps into another standard or another document. So when you look at some of the customization that's been taking place with the framework, um, the payment card industry was one good example. Um, HIPAA and healthcare and electronic medical records. There's documents out there where you'll see how they took the framework and aligned it into those sectors. And that touches everybody. It has nothing to do with industrial control systems. But you go into a doctor's office and you look at all the cyber assets they have and you wonder, is that office good enough to actually protect my medical records? Yeah, <laughs> laughing, I do agree. My doctor, they said they did. So I said, can I come in with my tools one day and really see? And of course, that's not what you like. Um, but that's what they've done. So the, they've taken these and they've shown how small organizations can self-assess themselves, use the framework 
aligned with their particular regulatory body, which would be HIPAA or uh, PCI, whatever. Another one that's very common um, is the Cyber Resiliency Review. Um, I like the word resilience. Resilience is starting to become more and more important. It's not, NIST hasn't embraced it as well as I would like, but it is starting to become a term we're considering. Think of resilience as being able to protect yourself from the unknowns, the future, right? So you can do everything possible to patch your systems and keep vulnerabilities out of these systems on a day-to-day -day basis. But is it really resilient to what's going to happen tomorrow? So resiliency really is another way that we look at a problem, both from what we know, and standards are very backwards looking. They're written around what's happened, not what will happen. Explains obviously why NERC SIP has gone through significant iterations to get to the current version they're at. So that's where we go with this. Now the other thing is, is the mappings between maturity models and different sectors. So there's been a lot of good work, and the three that were easy to find and that I brought to the table as reference is not only the electricity one, which we would have thought the electric utilities was going to be quick, but they also did a tailoring for oil and gas, oil and natural gas, and dams as well. So there's a good body here where we can take a look at that. i got nine minutes left. Now, this is about tools and customization. So... The government, the U.S. government's done everything they can to try to help people do this on their own. I found a wonderful tool out, free, freely downloadable. It's a simple Excel spreadsheet that allows you complete flexibility on how you want to address maturity models in the framework. So in the top left, we have how this particular person organized the maturity levels against policies, let me see, policies and processes. So this is going to look at it from two approaches. Now understand you can make this, you can have as many axes on this as you want. So we take a maturity level, and again, you'll notice the words are very similar to the words that have been used to define levels with other documents. And then you go into the framework and answer all of those questions. So what was that number, 108, I think, um, 108 or 109. And then you rate yourself based on where you're at from a practice perspective, what you're actually doing, the walking the walk, and from a process perspective. And then it takes, and you can see over here on the far right, it aggregates them then by function, or I'm sorry, by category. And then, when we advance it one more slide, it produces one of those really nice graphs that show where you have a problem. Again, very easy to visualize whether, so the, the target was to have a three on all categories. And in this particular case, both of our metrics were at or below where we would like to be. So we probably need to work on that one first. Then we come up over here where we talk about improvements, and you'll notice that <laughs> we have a very big disparity between what we say we do and what we actually do. So I like this tool a lot. And once you see how this works, you can really put anything you want in there. So depending on how you want to map the, 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 the profile now and what you're going to do, right? What you're going to do has to be based on some standard library. But this provides us with the one thing that most of the tools that I still see today really had a hard time doing, which was prioritization. So that was the biggest downfall of CSET for a long time because they don't really document how they prioritize and we kind of found ways that we thought it was prioritizing, but prioritization becomes very important. And there is no way a standard tool can tell everyone how to move forward. And that's why I really like these type of simple graphical representations where you can see where you need to be and then make your, your, your budgeting and your path forward based on that. Then we have the CSET tool. Has anybody played with version 9 yet? 9 now has done everything we've asked since version 1. It finally allows us a platform upon which we can do high levels of customization. So the first thing I did was say, hmm, 
Let's take CMMC and let's see how hard it would be to incorporate that into here. So when you go in and you do your prep stage, they got a new, they got the standard lineups they've had before. They add and remove some. Um, sure enough, down here at the very bottom is where we have version 1.1 of the framework is on here, as well as a variety of standards. Now, the thing is, is that most of these um, are the free standards or the government-issued standards. So there, we got into this little debate um, when 9 came out. People thought that IEC 62443 was finally in here. No, it's really not. They do make reference to it, but they don't have the standard. You still would need to purchase the standard in order to get full context. What was really important is what pops up when you pick framework. It talks about something that I was never really that impressed with, which was the profiling that takes place. So the profiling was supposed to allow us to do some customization of how these questions are being done. But when we look at what they've done this time, it's absolutely incredible. So I'm going to go past tiers. Depending on how you pick the framework, you can either do a requirements-based or a questions-based, right? So if you pick questions, it now provides kind of an interview session where you could go through line by line, answer a bunch of questions, and it'll give you a score. So 347 questions, that's going to take a bit of time. So when I do these, I like to give these in advance and have people read them and fill them in to the best of their ability before we do this. Then if we go to the requirements, you get one line for each of the subcategories in the framework. Okay, so again, it's not telling you what to do. It's asking about how you're doing things. So you've got room in the CSET tool to put in extra comments, supplemental information, and so on. But shoot, I have to deal with CMMMC now. But it's not in here. So now what you can do finally is build your own metrics and build your own process. So I go in and it's, it's now called modules. So you, if we, let's see if I go back. Up here when you go into the tools button right here, you'll be able to pull down and have the ability to create custom modules. So in this particular case, I build the general module. I'm going to say it's CMMC version 0 0.7. And then I go in and I start adding questions. <laughs> and what you do with each question is, of course, if you remember, the CMMC doesn't use this concept of security assurance level. So I've just done a vague mapping between the, the um, maturity level that's defined by the CMMC and this tool. So one of the requests that I've put forward to the development team is to A, allow this to be customizable. Because the CMMC actually has five levels, but I only have four, one, two, three, four buttons there, right? So you can now build out your own question set. So I just said, ah, let's put in three. And you'll notice that the way most of these maturity models, the higher the maturity level you want to be, the more requirements or concepts you would have to have deployed. So question one is for the basics. Everybody has to comply with one. Um, maturity level two, you would have two additional ones. So now when you come back to the cybersecurity question set and I do prepare, here's the new one that I built, right? And we picked assurance level one, or low, so we only have to answer one question. If, however, I would pick high, Remember, I built this out so that now I would have three questions. So now you can come in and you can create your own self-assessment with <laughs> the assessment tool that's taken eight revisions in order to get us to be able to do this. But it's really a significant improvement. And if anybody hasn't started playing around with version 9, I really encourage that to take place. So that's just the questions. So what I've done, and again, I didn't understand, or I wasn't briefed the process on how this information is going to be shared. So what I've done right now is all of the documentation that I've talked about and referenced, originally it was all on this slide and I took it off. So some of those crosswalks, some of the, um, the ways the tool's been used for specific sectors like dams or oil and natural gas, those are all on this page. So it's a timed page right now that's set to expire in two weeks. I mean, I can turn that off. That's easy. But it all depends on how Dale and the team wants to manage this with the overall website. So for instance, that little spreadsheet that I showed is one of the links that's on here. So 
with that, I've got one minute and 20 seconds, which is pretty timed. So if there's any questions. So you mentioned the, um, you know, in the manufacturing perspective where you have the sites and the operations driven, but then a lot of this seems to be your enterprise level versus your organizational level assessments. So do you recommend you can do an entire, doing the assessment, the maturity for the entire enterprise and then the individual sites because the criteria may be different and that's kind of a question of you need to have a, an enterprise-wide information security program but your operational requirements may be different. And so how do you manage then balance the, the framework alignment and assessments between the autonomous sites, uh, you know, actually producing and then the overall corporate standard? See, I think that actually is the question that's, that, that will remain unanswered for the foreseeable future. So for me, I'm a manufacturing guy. I would always start in the manufacturing assets because they have so many dynamic variables from site to site, whether it's unions and how labor's managed, whether it's supply chain interconnections, um, or the regulations of both local, state, countrywide, so I would always encourage it to take place at the asset. Now, then it becomes a problem of who manages the budget. So is it gonna be a corporate budget allocation or is it gonna be a local budget allocation? So what's found the greatest amount of success for us is to figure out how to make it an operational budget so that it can be done as an expense and we're able to get it moving fairly fast. Capital, you, everybody in here knows that does capital budgeting is difficult because it usually takes of a considerable amount of time and effort in order to get it funded. I have had the privilege of working with a couple major global companies that deployed two security programs. Because the numbers were so high, like one of them it was for 35 sites globally, the other one it was for 140. Those numbers were so big it required board of directors approvals. So you can imagine then that one took from the day we decided to do it to the day we got funding was over five years because that number was so big. I mean, we were way past the, what are we gonna do? That was able to get resolved in the first 12 months of the project. Here's what we need to do, but getting everything else in place. So I'm a person that would always say, start at the, start at the operational asset first. Well, and I really like the, the graph that you showed on the, the tool before. I guess you need to explore both of the tools, but the, not the CSET, but the, uh, that. Yeah, this maturity tool here, and if you go to the lower tier sites and build it and let them autonomously set their targets and then get together and review and see how if you can come to an agreement on an enterprise uh, maturity level and, and your definitions, but give the opportunity so you capture everyone's opinion and see where you can come up with an agreement. That's, that's an awesome point, and the one reason I really like this to take it and how I would consider customizing for this scenario is rather than say practices and processes, I would say corporate and local. Because corporate could have an idea of what they want and what they envision, but in practice, is it really being done? So even though it's still a practice and process, we could view it more as a central corporate view of the problem and solution versus a local view. I appreciate that, thank you. Hey, um, question. Um, you know, our, our our company or in our organization um, is working with the CMMC. You know, the government's given us a target of creating awareness and moving the needle, as they like to say, towards compliance on this evolving standard. As you know, uh, zero dot seven is out right now. But um, this tool here, have you seen anything that's simpler? The, the the problem that we have is dealing with the small and medium sized manufacturing base that are using industrial control systems. CEOs and COOs, you know, they're 50 or less or 100 less employees. I don't have anybody who's going to understand that. Our, our, our charter is to say, how do we simplify the understanding and, you know, the gap, here's where I am, but here's where I am. Have you seen anything out there? I mean, I like the beginning of this, but this chart, I mean, just having worked with, you know, a number of manufacturers in the Department of Defense, you know, critical infrastructure, supply chain base, their heads, you know, they don't know the cyber. They don't want to learn the cyber. They just want to keep getting their contract, right, which the standard's going to require them, the, you know, the framework, the maturity model is going to require them to comply with in order to continue to get that. But have you seen anything? Because we're in the process of building something. I was like, God, is there, you know, I don't, why would you invent the wheel, right, if you don't have to? See, I, I, I completely agree with the problem. And some of this, everybody in this room probably goes, well, we get this because this is, these domains or whatever you want to call them are very common.
The issue then becomes how do we scale? That's why I really like the framework. And, and, and the core idea behind the framework was putting anything you wanted behind. So for me, my favorite simple document is the Australian 35, which it originally was a document written to prevent targeted attacks. And for everybody that plays in this space, targeted attacks are the hardest to defend against. So you looked at this 35 and they were working with Microsoft to create a very, very significant document that's easy to read and easy to implement. It starts off with these columns that explain, is this particular request going to address prevention of the attack, identification and detection of the attack, or rapid response and recovery? Awesome concept, right? So it kind of falls in line immediately with the five functions of the framework. Then it also says, is this particular requirement or request going to be liked by the employees or is it going to be resented, <laughs> right? So I don't know about your company. My computer that's issued to me by my company, it's a dog because everything routes through their VPN. From a security perspective, love it. From a performance perspective, it's terrible. So everything's getting routed through their gateways, which is just enormously counterproductive to getting a lot of work done. So that's where this Australian 35 talks about all that. And it talks about, is it going to be easy to implement or is it going to be difficult to implement? Is it going to be, and they're very qualitative, not quantitative. Cost a lot of money or is it very simple to implement with not a lot of money at all involved? So, all right. And with, with that, I think we've got to wrap and get yep. ready for the next speaker here. Please join me in thanking Joel Landrell. That was great. <laughs>